Well, I've always been interested in the sea. I mean, I was a merchant seaman many years ago and I, I, I took up uh, sailing. Purely by chance, I was working with a guy that went diving and I got invited and uh, I had the first dive and I was hooked. Brian and I have been married for 40 years. He's a lovely husband, very caring, a very family man. Brian likes diving, that's his hobby and he thoroughly enjoys it. My best diving, really, when I consider the, the style of diving we do, is, a, is, is difficult because it's, it's quite varied. I've done quite a lot of diving abroad um, and I've had quite a few dives, obviously, around this area. On the occasion I had the bend, um, it was a fairly straightforward dive. Uh, we, we decided that the weather conditions and the tides were perfect. It was a deep dive and we were conscious that the, the time we had was limited because we were incurring a decompression penalty the longer we stayed down. I'd purchased this uh, the day before the dive when the incident happened and at the time I, ha I wasn't aware that the clip that attached the bag to the line was faulty. We completed the dive and we were ready to ascend and it was that point that I deployed the surface marker inflated it and sent it to the surface. Everything seemed in control at the initial ascent, but until we, we got to about 20 metres, it was then that I saw the line coming back down to me and I knew that I'd lost the bag. I got the spear out, used the same clip, which I found out later was faulty, deployed that and sent that up. Signal to the, uh, the lad I was with that we were gonna continue our ascent to our first decompression stop. We only moved a couple of metres and the line came back down and it was at that point that I knew that I had a serious problem. I couldn't ascend then safely. I knew I was totally out of the dive profile. I told the lad I was with to stay where he was. I would ascend again and see if I could attach the line. Unfortunately, the, the, on the second ascent, the line got completely tangled up around me and I had no option then but to stay on the surface. Just after that, the other lad surfaced as well. Um, and then we were recovered to the boat in the normal manner. I took the recovery position, which all divers would do, and it was at that point that I realised I was starting to get symptoms. Um, my initial reaction was to try and get to a hospital where I could get some on some oxygen, O2, to try and flush any nitrogen that was had come out of solution in my body, to try and flush it out, which would then hopefully have uh, removed the, um, the symptoms I was starting to suffer. I was fully conscious during the flight to, to the decompression unit and obviously they take you straight in as quickly as possible. There was a doctor on hand and the first thing he did was to check my computer to look at the dive profile. He then informed me that I would have to go into the, into the recompression unit to be treated. It's very claustrophobic in there and it's very, um, very hot as well. But you have to go through um, a, a regime of... Uh, and being administered oxygen for certain periods. We've got two chambers, one's our medical chamber and that's one that we use mainly every day and for diving accidents as well. That can hold up to 10 to 11 patients. The function of it, the main process, is that it compresses the air to a much greater depth. So it would be the equivalent of going underwater. The most common for the decompression illness um, is, is pain in the joints or rashes or itchiness. Uh, the most serious that we get is paralysis. Hi Liam. Hi Brian. Nice to see you again. You all right, mate? Yes, I'm very well. How are you? Not too bad. Good. So what we're doing from the outside, we're watching you, we're listening to you. Obviously it's a contained unit, it's a sealed unit, so all the gases change constantly. So our job is to maintain the gases at a normal level as what they would be out here. Okay, Brian, if you follow me inside, I'll show you around, okay? Just mind your head on the way in. Yeah, okay. And again on this one. What can you remember when you were on I, I, I do remember uh, um, being on the bed and being I had to sit in a certain position and I remember the oxygen mask yeah. uh, and, I, and I do remember the environment while I was in here. It was very sort of hot and uncomfortable. Yes, I say, I, I do remember it all now, the, uh, the, all the equipment. Uh, yeah. Particularly unpleasant um, episode to go through, but obviously it, it was very important that I, yeah. I get the right treatment at the time. So. I mean, it, it is a very <coughs> unnatural for people when they come in here, um, you're sitting in a container basically with windows and doors. The only thing is you can't get out when you're in here. Yes, you've yeah, got to stay the whole yeah, way yeah, through yeah, with yeah, us. Yeah, um, but that, that's why we, we put someone in here with you 
So yeah. as well as them looking after you, you've got someone to actually talk to and communicate with. Right. If you're in here on your own, it yeah. wouldn't be pleasant. At the time, I was obviously very uh, concerned, but I have sort of put those memories to one side. But coming back in now, obviously coming into the room where I was initially examined, not knowing what was going to happen, um, um, I do feel that the memories are starting to flood back, but not in a, a disturbing way for me. Brian was suffering with uh, spinal decompression illness, so he, he had partial, um, partial paralysis to the nerves that were supplying his legs and his arms. So he did have altered sensation, which was uh, a result of the, the, the injury to the nerves themselves. Um, but when, he, when I asked him what he can remember, he told me that he was in there for about 18 hours, when in fact it was probably only about five or six hours that he was in there. So it can seem like a lifetime you're in there, but it's because his brain was racing. The worst thing that you can do is leave it, um, and from the results from that would be either paralysis or permanent serious damage to your body. And if you leave it, then sometimes we can't recover. It's, it's sort of um, made me more aware of what, what can go wrong and what will go wrong if I don't pay more attention to what I'm doing when I'm actually going diving. Because of the incidents, I've had to cope with being able to get myself back into a frame of mind where I can go diving again or pack it all together. But I want to actually experience a dive again in knowledge I've got full control over my own equipment and uh, with the knowledge that I've put the incident behind me. To me, and, and because probably because I've been diving so long, any dive is a challenge. Uh, I, you know, I'm always famous for my sayings, and one of my favourite sayings is, any dive you walk away from is a good dive. We're part of the British Sub Aqua Club, and the British Sub Aqua Club have a set curriculum that we have to train to. It starts off as ocean diver, then they progress, trainees progress to sport diver, then to dive leader, then to advanced diver and up as high as first class diver if they wish. Nobody progresses to open water without they've reached a certain level of competency um, and confidence within the pool. So we would not ask anyone to go into open water who has not reached that level. A typical example of someone showing signs of panic is uh, wide staring eyes, unresponsive to signals, simple signals. It's not a sport where we push people into achieving goals. There's no set timetable. You, you progress at your, your own pace. Well, decompression sickness is something that the trainees are taught about in the theoretical side. Hopefully they never experience it for real. Um, and if all the training drills are followed, then um, they shouldn't experience decompression illness at all. Um, however, they, they are trained to recognise the signs and symptoms of it. Um, uh, but as I say, hopefully it never gets to that, to that stage. Yeah, I was shocked when I heard about Brian. Um, mainly because the, the, the level of qualification that Brian's got, he's an advanced diver. The dive that he was doing was, was within sport diver range. So it was well within Brian's capability. But it just goes to show that even the most experienced person um, can get things wrong. One of my other favourite sayings is uh, once you think you know everything about this sport it will turn around and bite you in the bum. But as soon as I started to get my kit ready I started to think about the incident with the uh, delayed SMB and I really just wanted to come back into the pool just to practice the procedure over and over again to make sure that I was totally comfortable with being able to carry out the manoeuvre in a real life situation. I must admit, going down into the pool did bring a lot, a lot of the memories back. And I think uh, we executed the, the ascents really well and I feel fully confident now to return to open water diving. The way I feel at the moment, obviously I'm a bit apprehensive and I really uh, want to get myself settled and get into the water. I think once I'm in the water, I'm making a descent back down to uh, back down to the deck, I'll probably be in, uh, feel, feel a lot better about it because I'll be in more control. But it is sort of going through my mind now, but as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that uh, 
dive is going to be successful, so I'm, I'm, I'm relaxed enough about it, but I'm with a slight tinge of apprehension. Really bright. One, two, three, I feel elated to be honest with you. As I say, it was a, it was a disturbing incident when it happened. Um, I've gone through it. I've uh, obviously recapped with my training with me, my, my diving officer, and the, the dive was uh, flawless. And I do feel a lot better now. And I, I'm, I'm, re I'm now ready for the dive season to carry on as normal.